And we've got a good crowd to join us. A lot of hellos from people coming in from all over the world. From the US, from Singapore, Australia, Malaysia, New Zealand, different parts of the US. So hi everybody. Very, very excited to be here. Welcome to the Global Virtual Book Club. And we have an exciting guests joining us here from different parts of the US today. My name is Shamin Tan. So I'm the exec advisor at a local Australian cybersecurity consulting firm. And I'm also the author of Cyber Risk Leaders, which is why we are all looking to have good conversations with different industry leaders around the world. Yeah, and I'm here with my co-host, my lovely friend, Carmen Marsh. And it's all credit to her for her great idea to hosting and running this book club every few weeks. So Carmen Marsh, over to you. Yes, hi everyone, and uh, this is now what episode four of Cyber Risk Leaders Show Off. Um, so yeah, my name is Cameron Marsh, and I am the CEO of Intelligenza and the founder of Hundred Women in Hundred Days Cybersecurity Career Accelerator and Cybersecurity Woman of the Year Awards. And uh, why don't we just go and uh, the introductions, Theresa and Jason, please. I'm, uh, I'm Jason Elrod. I'm the Executive Director of Cybersecurity and Investigations for Sutter Health here in Northern California. Awesome. Teresa Payton. Hi, everybody. CEO of Fortalist Solutions, a cybersecurity and intelligence operations company, and former White House Chief Information Officer under President George W. Bush. And I've got a new book out, so we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Excellent. So really, really good to have amazing people in our house today for those who have actually missed the last few episodes we had jen lawman the first size for the state of michigan and other states too we had different industry leaders from australia singapore you feel free to catch up on the conversations they will be on the cyber risk meetup youtube channel but with that we're gonna just dive straight into a couple of very exciting topics today so we're going to look at chapter two for those who have a copy of this book, feel free to turn to the same chapter where we actually discuss about all sizes not being equal and we look at a number of different traits an effective leader should have in a crisis moment. So Carmen, did you have some questions you want to talk to Teresa and Jason about? Yes, I actually, I, I do. And, and I know that it is something super important in both of your roles. I know, Jason, you are uh, working for Sutter Health and there's a lot of crisis. I mean, there, there are things that happen pro probably daily that you have to deal with and you have to be that strong leader and you have to be the re leader that can, can really keep a team focused and heads down. And also uh, keep them motivated. So, so what are the tips and some of the things that you do uh, to, to keep the team going and keep them calm and focused on, on the, uh, you know, solving the problem at hand? Well, I think as a, well, a leader, um, I, I thought about this a little bit. I think there's probably five uh, primary traits uh, to be an effective leader during crisis. And not all crises are or cyber, for instance, um, we're talking about. Mm. Sometimes there's externalities like uh, COVID and the pandemic. And so you have to operate with enterprises. So um, I think the, the, these five sort of traits I thought about um, were common, were common whenever, you know, whenever a crisis would come up, regardless of the context. So I think the, the first thing would, um, you mentioned, you know, you kind of keep everybody else calm. You should have to be calm. So one of, one of the most effective traits of a leader is being calm. And that's always the first step. Uh, the more that you're emotionally elevated, the more your team will be emotionally elevated. Uh, and the more that happens, the less logical uh, people become. It's a function of neurophysiology. When you're in that fight or flight mode, you can't really take proactive action. And, sort of, and you're stuck in that kind of reactive model. So number one, probably just being calm, as calm as you can be. And I think you get there by what I call number two, by being present. So you need to be in the mm -hmm. moment and, and awesome. get an understanding of you know, what you can change, what you can influence, and what you can't. And your focus needs to be on the first two, um, because that will help you with the calmness. Um, third, I think uh, effective 
uh, crisis leaders, great communicators. You have to establish a cadence. It's important uh, to do so because it gives a sense of structure and normalcy. Um, of course, you have an important update to do those sooner, but really establish a cadence. And you have to be clear and succinct and literal and factual in your communication in a crisis. Uh, you have to leave ambiguity and inference at the door. It's not a place for it. Um, and I suppose the last couple of things would be, uh, you gotta be willing to put uh, your opinions to the test. So a crisis is no place for vanity or ego. Mm, um, yeah. it's, so, it's really not. Um, so you have to listen to the, you have to listen to all the facts. You're already in a crisis, so avoid adding to it. I mean, we've, we've all hired smart people to do the job, so let them do it. Um, but once you've considered all the facts at your disposal, your job as a leader is to actually make a decision and drive action. So you have to be strong enough to entertain disagreements. Uh, and you have to be mm -hmm. able to discuss debate in good faith um, because you know, being a leader is not about always being right. Uh, but it's about knowing when a decision needs to be made and then making it. And finally, I, I think it's about being flexible. Um, uh, I, I you have the ability to leap logical levels laughingly. Mm -hmm. Extra points if you can say that five times. Because <laughs> um, a crisis is going to demand flexibility. Right? You need to be able to think strategically while acting tactically. And for some, uh, some folks, this isn't an easy thing um, because an excellent crisis leader is different than an excellent growth or operations focused leader. So, what makes you successful in one context does not necessarily translate into success in another context, like back or forth. Like a crisis leader is not necessarily your best growth or operations. You know what, you touch every single point and it makes so much sense to me. Um, I think it's, it's uh, you know, if, if leaders, anyone, it, whether you're a CISO or any, you know, a, a leader of a team in any type of crisis, regardless of what it's an incident or, or anything, but if you can follow those guidelines, I mean, you, 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 you know, more than halfway is there to being an effective leader. Um, so, um, the reason I want to ask you the same thing, uh, I know you, I can't even imagine being, uh, you know, the, the CEO and the president of, uh, of a large consulting company, um, very successful company, and then also a CIO, CIO of the White House in the past. I mean, how much pressure, how much stress you've had, and um, how did you deal and how do you deal with your team and how do you handle some of that with your team? Yeah, I mean, I like so many of the things that Jason said, um, and I, that was all really um, insightful. And I I agree um, with what you said, Jason. I I would say some of the other things too is understand you will go through crises, and so have a playbook before you actually go through one that says it may not be step one through one hundred for every single crisis you could go through, but actually think about the fact that if there is a crisis what's the call tree how will things work who will i put in charge of running the tactics so that i can still lead and mm -hmm. have somebody in the weeds running the tactics and reporting back that i know and can trust and be unflappable in that crisis and sometimes it may be well the person's going to be me it, dep it depends on the maturity of the people in your organization depends on the crisis but also you know make sure that when you're not in crisis that you practice a crisis with the team so there's a little bit of a muscle memory and, and a little bit of an understanding of what the battle rhythm might feel like um, and then of course once you go through that crisis the playbook may or may not work and so then you have to be flexible and be able to you know be dynamic on the fly I think the other thing I remember when I first started uh, to learn how to water ski, I remember somebody, a very seasoned water skier told me, is Teresa, always make sure you have slack because if you're flat out and you hit a wake, you've got no way to recover because you were already flat out. And that's the same thing with preparing and responding to a crisis. So if you're running your team and you're running yourself flat out, you have no slack to be ready for the crisis. Right, so you have to be thinking, and when you're in the crisis, you have to have 
some type of slack built in for thinking, for responding, for digesting what you're going through. Um, and so I, I think all of those other tactics are ways to plan so that when you're in the crisis, the things that Jason was talking about are really helpful. That's the benefit of going after you, Jason, is like, oh, Jason already covered all that. So here's what you do before. But, uh, but, but I would say the other thing that is really Taking often, notes. yeah, the, the other thing that I think is really often overlooked uh, and I'm reminding people about it as we go through now, right? As we're going through COVID-19, as we go through what a, a very necessary anti-racism movement, there's a mm. lot of disruption and there's a lot of emotion. And yes. you know, at a time where we all want to just hug each other and and hug it hug it out, so to speak. Um, we're not supposed to be together. I, I mean, so it's a really challenging time for so many on so many levels. And people, burnout is real. Is and real. If, if you are, I, I remind my team and my clients all the time about this, especially the CISOs, and that is you have to every day schedule in something that nourishes you. And maybe you don't have an hour to work out right now. It, that's fine. Find 15 minutes four times during the day. Don't go on social media. Don't watch the news. Nourishment. Mm. You can do that. Uh, mm. You can do that too. But nourishment, whatever that nourishment is, it could be a power nap. It could be doing a poem, a crossword puzzle. For me, it's running. So I get up extra early in the morning and I go run and I pray and I meditate. It's my only quiet time right now. Um, and, and so, but you got to find for you and you've got to put it in the schedule and it has to be something daily where you unplug and nourish and replenish. That's how you build the slack into your own day. And if you're going to be a leader during a crisis, people are watching what you say and do. And if they see you burning yourself out, they think, okay, that's how I'm supposed to be. And then they decide whether or not they're up for that. So those would be the only other, you know, kind of things that I would add to what Jason said. Um, you know, to, I actually love that. Yeah. Because as what Sarita says, it's all about the lifestyle as well, like being intentional to put that as part of your lifestyle and you don't wait till you have a crisis. Then you start thinking about what your actions should be, what's the strategy, because when you're in a crisis mode, it's hard to be calm, to look at things with the right lens. So already, even though we are right now in that pandemic situation and so many other crisis situation, we should be thinking about the future crisis, thinking about how we can be strategic, allocating time also to focus on the strategy and the next steps. And that's all part of being a effective leader. Yeah, Shemaine, exactly. But learn how to pause. I think mm. a lot of people are so, you know, heads down and it's from one thing to another, one thing to another. If you don't pause, you lose the opportunity um, to actually think. And you have to think to make the decisions, right? And if you don't ever pause, you will not have a capacity to make good decisions. You double down on that self-care one. <laughs> Got to have it. You have, if you can't, you need to care for yourself first and then you can care for others, mm -hmm. yeah. and you can then you, know, you have to be you have to have the energy uh, be present enough to do that. So that's huge. So Jason, mm -hmm. you know what I tell um, my leadership team because I fly. Well, I did pre-COVID. I flew all the time. And I'm like, what do they tell you to do during the safety demonstration? They tell you to put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you help others. Yeah. So yeah. I always say, exactly. yeah, oxygen mask mm -hmm. on first, and then you help others. You can't help anybody if you pass out. Yep. Mm. Don't care yep. how talented you are. And that's a good. If you forget, right? This this is one thing that will bring you back to <laughs> to that. Just remember what you learn when you uh, you fly, <laughs> what you've been told. So, yeah, very very true. Yeah, so we're talking about like people management, about looking after yourself, but there is also this chapter in chapter four where we talk about going into the future, right? And actually interview quite a few SISO leaders and other C-suite. And there was this statement that was made where some of the brightest team 
that they've had. They actually brought in young professionals from diverse backgrounds, interns, students, and, and really just looking at people who have different perspectives. And they were very intentional in trying to build a diverse culture to try and promote innovations and learning. So we will take it to the next step. Can you guys actually share how have you built up your teams in the past or currently and what have you done to promote innovation and a culture of learning? Who wants so, to go first? Well, I'll, I'll give Jason, I'll, I'll go first so Jason doesn't have to go first again. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I think a couple of things. The, the first one is, is, you know, I get asked all of the time about the talent shortage. And, and candidly, if you're still looking for the same resume and certifications and qualifications that everybody else is, um, keep doing that because I'll get to hire the other people. So I always tell I always tell hiring managers that tell me they have a problem filling their jobs or things like that. I'm like, first of all, have you read your job descriptions? They sound soul crushing. Um, there's like an alphabet soup of every certification. Degrees are required. It doesn't. I, I don't get fired up reading it. It's like you know, who wants to look at a job description that sounds like you're turning firewall knobs all day? And, you know, t tell us what the mission is. Tell tell us like once I tune the firewalls, what happens? What am I protecting? What am I defending? Um, you know, how's it fit into the strategy? And then why are you requiring a four year degree for some people? Why are you requiring certifications at all? Um, do you not trust your technical team enough to see if somebody's actually learned on the job and knows just as much as a certification? They just haven't had the money or the time to go get certified. So, so to me, I think there's a lot of the job that can be taught. What I cannot teach you is how to show up wired. I need people who are insatiable problem solvers, who yeah. um, the job is changing all the time. I need people who are like, I don't mind con being constant learning mode. Uh, I need people who can work in a gray area. You know, the rules of engagement might be clear, but then how you get in, it's not going to be a checklist. It's going to be creativity and figuring it out as you go. Um, so we, we hire people who may or may not have a degree. We hire people out of all walks of life doing career changes. Um, and we just look for a lot of the things that they're wired at. Maybe they've been an investigator, but they weren't in cybersecurity. We can teach them some of the other things. So those are all that we also look for diversity of all walks of life, socioeconomic background, ethnic diversity, gender diversity, uh, what types of degrees. So we've got a variety. Um, on the team. I would say full, fostering innovation is interesting. Um, I wouldn't say I've got the whole thing nailed down because we're not a product company. We're a consulting services company. But one of the things that we have done is we try to set aside time in the calendar for pro bono work. So we do work on uh, missing persons cases, ending child trafficking, uh, for nonprofits, doing training for National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Wow. So we've got, we set aside time for that. And one of the things we're constantly asking ourselves is, is there something that as either the practices are evolving or, or new frameworks come out, is there something we can do internally that's scalable and repeatable that our clients can really benefit from? And what's that innovation look like? And inviting the clients in on that innovation. Like, are you open to okay, you've got a CMMC review, you've had certification you're getting ready for. Are you open to us looking at it this different way, giving you some pivot tables? So yeah, it answers the mail on what the CMMC certifiers might be looking for, but at the same time, instead of just checking the box, are you willing to let us kind of pivot and do some other things that'll help make sure that bad things don't really happen because checklists don't stop criminals from breaking in, right? So there's other things that have to happen. So to me, I think innovation has to be a mindset that you have to build into the schedule, um, but it's not something you can say, hey, on Mondays at 10, we're gonna be innovative and creative, and then Tuesdays we're not. So you've gotta, you have to find and foster a culture where people feel very comfortable to bring an idea and know that failure, there's actually, if you can fail fall, fail small and fail fast within defined parameters, there's a lot of learning that comes from that. You have to get people yes. comfortable with, you have to get people comfortable with that. So that, and I'm sure Jason, uh, you'll probably add some amazing <laughs> ideas to that. 
Okay, I'm taking notes. I'm, taking notes. <laughs> so, I'm ready for guitar playing. And yes. I showed up just to get some good tidbits. That's all I did. I'm just here for that. <laughs> so um, go for it, uh, Jason. Yeah. Well, I, um, yeah, Teresa, you covered covered a lot of ground, and I and and I agree wholeheartedly. I have a lot of the same opinions on it. I think I'll speak to both points a little bit uh, differently. I think um, with an existing team, as far as encouraging learning as an in, an innovation, um, build it into the development plans. You know, uh, I'm all about engaging intellectual curiosity. So if that's in, if it's in something that's even sort of related to your job. Research it, write about it, present it, and so we can celebrate it. And so we want to build that culture of intellectual curiosity within our team. Yes. So you, you do that mm -hmm. part. And um, it's amazing some of the things we, we hear about and some of the things that are brought forth because of that. Um, and it does land on that same idea. Stay hungry. You know, stay current. Always be learning. You know, um, you just can't stop. New knowledge is being created uh, daily. Pursue it. Whatever it is, because I think um, the issues we deal with um, are multivariate. So the solutions we bring to it have to be multivariate as well. And I think from an innovation standpoint, uh, if, if you're thinking about buying a book, just do it. It's one of the few things in life that is pretty much guaranteed to pay you back. One new idea or distinction makes it worth it. And so book clubs. Getting a book, look at it. What are you reading? What am I reading? Mm -hmm. Where is it? Buy a book. I mean, what are you waiting for? <laughs> There's a couple of great authors right here. Um, if you're looking for suggestions. Yeah. So, so innovation, you, you, you need to look at all those things and, and don't wait on it. It's mm. right now. I mean, th th those are the things. Yeah, and that's part of a being a, a great leader too, to to support that, encourage it, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of just saying go do your job and you don't leave until you finish your project, you know, you, you really have to foster that, <laughs> you know. It's okay. I noticed you're on, you're on your review, it says you were going to present something cool. So yeah. <laughs> so be cool. Go be cool. <laughs> do it in in and um that kind of innovation, that, that, that kind of, um, that's innovation. You know, being people's interest and their curiosity to table yes. and celebrate it. I think the more we can do that, uh, the more we're going to free people up to um, express themselves. Mm. And, and, and that also going to, we also mentioned a little bit about building teams, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, hire for personality and diverse mindset. Train for the specific skill, and we can do that. And one of the biggest assets an employee brings to the team, any team, is their mindset. Is there healthy inquiry, intellectual curiosity, compassion, mm. self-discipline, God forbid, humility, okay? There's always a baseline talent profile and capability to do any job in order to get hired. That's table stakes. But beyond that, it's about working as a team, having each other's back, and being able to both challenge and accept being challenged to do your best. And I gotta remember, there's no such thing as a perfect employee. Only mm -hmm. complementary fits. You need to blend the strengths and weaknesses of a team to compose the best team. It's like putting together pieces of a puzzle. The shapes have to fit properly to make the team work, but they don't have to be the same shapes to fit. There's strength and excellence and diversity, and that's what we need to concentrate on when, when we're working on team development, cohesion, and um, and just doing a better job. And that's, that's maybe a good recommendation for the hiring managers, right? When you when you hire someone, have the team interview them. Have you know it should be so it should be such a collaborative conversation. It should be open and interactive conversation, not just between the hiring manager and the candidate, but but you know, if you bring somebody onto the team, how is that person going to um, do, you know? With the rest of the team and vice versa, right? So, so I I know that I've been doing that because I think that was that's usually worked out the best. You know, having everybody meet and see how well they even the, the initial conversation, how that goes, and how this you know if there's any synergy. I mean, you can tell pretty much right off the bat if there's there's going to be a good, um, yeah, the good fit. I don't know, but if you don't let them to meet each other and talk to each other, how would you mm -hmm. know? Bring yeah. some 
be on, on board and then things don't go so well. They may have all the great skills, right? And all the, the everything on the, the piece of paper that you've asked for, they've got it. But, you know, then the personality doesn't quite quite fit with the rest of the team. And that can be fun. No brilliant jerks. <laughs> no yeah. brilliant jerks. Okay. A single talented but self-absorbed member of the team can be toxic to the group. And yes. unfortunately, intellect and talent often travel with ego and vanity. No matter, but you know, no matter how smart or talented an individual is, it's just not worth it in the long run. Yeah, so true. Team, that kind of experience because it's divisive. So no brilliant jerks. That's my word. Don't hire brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to add another thing as well. It's not just also looking for culture fit, right? But culture add. So someone who can, you know, as you mentioned, compliment, but also yes. add to the culture. And yes. I think from what I've seen, um, some of the really impressive CEOs that have managed to build a great culture for their company is where they they lead by example. So they're extremely transparent, but they're also very affirming of people's successes. They celebrate it, but there is no fear for people to fail. So yes. that's an interesting thing because like, you know, the cyber breaches of if people make mistakes, uh, you know, human factor coming in, uh, sometimes in a company where they're afraid that it's going to get escalated and they're afraid of the consequences, then they try to keep it hidden. And that's bad for the entire organization. But mm -hmm. for those companies that have built a really great culture, people are, are okay and open to say, hey, you know, this actually happened. What should I do about it? And that puts the company in a really much better position to deal with breaches or anything like that. So the culture has a big part to play in terms of making the organization a safer place. At the end of the day, it's all yeah. about the human connection that you have built. Yeah, building that culture, exactly. And, and I know, uh, Teresa, you do have that experience building the team. So um, um, I, I don't know the size of your company, but you you probably started with just a few people and then, and then you grow and you keep adding and adding and all of that really is every person you hire on is super important as you as you're building the business and you're growing your company so so yeah it's it's super important to to build that right culture and 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 let others look up to you as a leader right if you if you you are the you're the one they're going to look up to you to and follow what you're doing and and um, bring all those things that we were talking about right um into building the teams and companies yeah, and we can't forget about um, Teresa's book. That's uh, I think mean, yes. very exciting. Yeah, yeah. to Not hear so much about it. it. So the, the 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 name of the book is "Manipulated Inside a Cyber War to Hijack Election and Distort Distort the Truth." Yeah, just a little light um, reading. <laughs> yeah. So so when you wrote the book, who who was your intended audience? I mean, who did you write it for? Because you probably had in, in mind, you know, um, the readers, you know, who 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 is your audience in your mind? I, I wrote it for everybody who cares about democracy. So it's a global book. And I it's been a passion project for almost five years. Um, I wanted to, it, I just couldn't find the right time to have people interested in the book project. Uh, and then kind of the Russians helped me out uh, with, with 2016 and just kind of what they pulled off. And I really wanted to help people understand it's not just about the 2016 U.S. election. It's not even about picking winners and losers. It's about destroying democracy, destroying the ability for social discourse, um, trying to make you uh, kind of leave people with the feeling of you don't know who to trust. Because if you don't know who to trust, then it opens you to trusting anything. Uh, and so the manipulation campaigns, I just felt like needed to be exposed because social media companies can try their hardest and their darndest, but they can't solve this alone. And uh, political organ, you know, kind of the elected officials around the world are not going to be able to create laws that are going to stop this. And the media can't spot it all and point it out. Um, so it's really going to be a team sport. And it's actually up to us to be part of that team sport. 
uh, to actually stop these manipulation campaigns from happening. So that, so what I did to try and make it, because it can be a little bit of a heavy topic, and it can get quite technical. So what I tried to do is every chapter actually has a fictional vignette. Um, from my crazy brain, because I'm a conspiracy theorist. Um, and I know it, and I admit it for the first time in the book publicly, and I talk about where that comes from. Uh, and so I do a fictional story just to kind of pull you in, and then I actually show you how the facts could support that fictional story. But I'm a big um, believer in giving everybody actionable intelligence, something that you can do without having to be technical. And so I spend a lot of time in the book telling people, first of all, how to spot this like a pro, uh, where the challenges are in spotting these, and then what to do about it. So the different things that we should all be asking for. Um, so for those of you who are listening in, who are incredibly savvy at spotting the manipulation campaigns, this book is actually for your mother, your father, um, all of your relatives who um, you feel like they don't have a broad perspective on the news, um, this is for them. That is awesome. <laughs> Can you share one takeaway? What's uh, that? You know, really interesting takeaway from the book. Oh, an interesting takeaway. So, um, so I reveal several things that have not been reported anyplace else. Um, one of which was when I uh, went out to write the book, I went out to social media and said, if you are a manipulator or if you believe you've been manipulated i would like to interview you for the book mm. um and a lot of crazies reached out to me which is you know that's pretty you know it's pretty that's what you get when you ask the internet right um to reach out to you but oh. I ended up having somebody who saw my ask who started doing some research on me realized that he had a friend in common and he actually went to that friend and said, I've worked on something I've never told anybody. My friends don't know, my family doesn't know, my current employer doesn't know, you don't even know, and I wanna tell my story to Teresa. So that chapter is Hacker X. Um, and so that, and, and that's not even the full story, it was what I could fit into, like he could be his own book, um, and so that story, and I had to write it very carefully because I need to protect his identity. I don't actually know his real name. Uh, I interviewed him several times over a video conference, yet it turned off. And he decided at some point to, um, that he trusted me. So we actually met in person. Wow. So I, I write about as much of that as I can in the chapter on Hacker, Hacker X, but you, you will be surprised. Um, he is a red-blooded American who loves democracy, but he was the mastermind behind probably one of the biggest manipulation campaigns in American politics in wow. the 2016 elections. That's incredible. So where do we buy your book? Yeah, where I know. <laughs> yes, so you can buy the book on uh, any bookstore. They're all selling it. Um, so any of your online bookstores that you know and love, uh, it's in electronic book format. It's in audible format. I got the opportunity to read my own book. <laughs> that was an interesting experience and it's available um, in, in hardcover. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can buy it from your favorite independent bookstore. Uh, for anybody who wants to get it personalized, if you reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'll give you the information from my local bookstore and you can buy it from them. They'll call me and I'll go in and actually personalize the book and they'll ship it anywhere you want in the world. So they said they've had people calling them and emailing them from Singapore, Australia. Um, yeah, it, yeah and, and it's an honor. So like there's no order too big that I won't personalize and sign or too small one book or you know a thousand books whatever it is i'm happy to happy to do it that's awesome that's really really awesome mm -hmm. yeah and also it will be included in the um, in this video recording this video is going to go out to the cyber risk meetup community so we will be putting the links into the video description as well um it will be on the cyber risk youtube channel so exciting else is listening, we will provide other links there as we wrap up we'll give um, Teresa and Jason, maybe a quick couple of seconds to share about a big takeaway or an advice that you want to leave to our cyber risk leaders on 
on how they can be more effective as a leader? Maybe what's the one tip that you're going to leave with them? Okay, so I'll give you time to think about it. For those who are still here joining us, you can also catch up on the recording on the YouTube as mentioned earlier, but it will also be available on the audio on podcast, which is called the Mega C-Suite Stories. And I think that's pretty much it. And those who are interested in the Cyber Risk Leaders book too, you can check it out on a marketplace. Very quickly, it's really just a collection of insights from different C-Suite across different industries, across countries. And it's really about extracting tips on and, and their approaches on how they work with other C-Suites and how they lead from the front. So there's a lot of really exciting stories as well. I think there's about 70 over different voices in this book. So yeah, you can check it out. And with that, We've come to the end of this session. Teresa and Jason, are you ready with your one big tip? <laughs> <laughs> my parting words. Sorry, parting my parting words. Um, I, I, I think, um, I guess what I would say, just, just show up, be present, uh, get a plan and make it happen. Um, that's your job as a leader. Um, and then that's, a, that's your job for yourself in your life. So I think those three things, be present, mm. your plan, make it happen. You work in a crisis in your life. Love that. There you go. Awesome. We, we need you. Um, so don't let burnout chase you out of the field. We need everybody mm. um, to fight the good fight. And so, you know, um, I think you know, what Jason just said, and just remember, um, this job is hard by design this job is really hard but you're doing noble cause work right so what whoever you're doing it for think about the data you're protecting the intellectual property you're protecting um mm. just know like the ceo of your organization sleeps better at night knowing you're at the helm right so that's a lot of pressure but you're up for it and don't burn out and when you need help you need a lifeline you got linkedin you've got this community um that carmen and shemaine have you know created here reach out for a lifeline or you know just call somebody up and just say i just i i have to do a presentation on my board or I, my budget's just got cut and i i'm not really sure where to get started like leverage your peer group to help you um we don't all have the answers either and in some cases, yeah, we're making it up as we go along. So, you know, just just know that and just reach out to people. Uh, just know this is a very accepting, welcoming, um, and encouraging community, and you're not alone. So if you need help, just reach out and ask for it. Yeah, you that. Hit me up on LinkedIn, hit me out on Twitter, send me a message. Our LinkedIn details and Twitter also will be on the YouTube description. Yeah, so you can feel free to follow us and keep the conversation going. Yeah, but I really love what you all have shared. It's so beautiful. And Carmen, maybe you want to end off with your closing words. Yes, I just, I really, I really enjoyed this conversation. I mean, I enjoy every, every conversation, but this, this was really, um, I don't know, one of my, my favorites, <laughs> uh, you know, really good, good stuff shared here. Um, oh, yeah. you know, just, yeah, same thing as, as what Jason and Teresa said and you, uh, we have a great community, uh, you know, reach out anytime and um, keep, yeah, just stay connected with all of us. Thank you so much for your time coming. Uh, Teresa, I loved, um, you know, your tips and, and just how natural and how inspiring yeah. you are, <laughs> you know, so same thing, Shemaine, thank you again for another episode of um, Virtual Book and see you next time. <laughs> thank you, everyone. It was very well nice to everybody. Thank you. Thanks. I do what I want. I'm gonna sing down under the water. I do what